Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are quite thrilled to be able to present at uh, our first Foresight event, and uh, especially on a topic that we ourselves find quite interesting. So today we want to discuss the recent rise in telemedicine and in virtual care solutions as a whole. Now the pandemic showed us a small preview of the potential in, um, in virtual care and left us to ponder about what its place might be in the world of healthcare going forward. So back in the day, when there still existed landlines attached to the wall with meters and meters of curly cord attached to it, which invariably meant that the entire family ended up getting entangled in this cord whilst one person randomly walked around the kitchen chatting to their best friend. It was during this era that telemedicine was born. It was also during this era that you couldn't be on the phone and on the internet at the same time, but that's a nightmare I'd rather not relive right now. <laughs> anyway, um, during this time, there were a few telemedicine studies underway. They mainly required the participant to phone a designated phone number every single day, which would contact, connect them with a, an operator. This operator would ask them a series of scripted questions in order to monitor their health symptoms and then further direct them to a referring um, GP or nurse, organize for another script to be sent out to the patient, or organize to phone the patient a little bit later on in the day in order to monitor their symptoms on an hourly or two hourly basis. One particular study found that amongst diabetes patients, that this form of consistent access to very primary health care had sufficient impact to reduce emergency room consultations by 11%, to reduce inpatient um, admissions by 50%, and to reduce the average length of stay of these patients by three days. So, Although this was a very manual process and not particularly easily scalable to be able to treat, treat large numbers of patients, they must have been doing something right. They certainly must have been doing something right. Okay, so the core concepts of telemedicine still exist today. But perhaps you could say that the model of service delivery has changed, and it's changed because it's had to change. The pandemic made some things just unattainable. Patients simply felt too much risk to go and visit their practitioners in person, and so there was almost a void in the healthcare world, healthcare services, a whole tier of services that were perhaps missing. Now, provider groups and schemes alike rapidly banded together to address this concern and quickly responded by developing the administration systems and the technological infrastructure that would allow for a substitute offering, right? In this emergency period, we saw the rise of virtual consultations. Now, as we mentioned, the modern idea of virtual consultations have come quite a long way from their rudimentary origins in telemedicine. There is no longer this idea of dealing with a scripted operator who will ask you standard questions. No, now you will directly interface with the medical practitioner whom you likely would have seen had you gone to visit them in person, had you physically attended. Right, and this applies over a variety of disciplines. It is concentrated, right? GPs, psychologists, psychiatrists. These are perhaps the disciplines that are more effectively used virtually. Specialists like dermatologists are also quite relevant. And a wider array of specialists in perhaps a more refined context, like for referrals, for example, are also things that are particularly relevant, right? Um, but the, the evolution of virtual consults from telemedicine also really stems in the, the use of technology. I think in 2021, there's a figure that states that close to 70% of those virtual consultations made use of either images or high quality video feed or both perhaps, right? And this obviously enables a, a practitioner better information um, to effectively make a diagnostic decision, but more so it also makes sure that 
certain aspects like patient reported data, right? Like when a provider asks for vitals, are you taking your pulse properly? Can I verify that this is being done properly? There adds an element of control. And so the idea is that this new model, this new way of delivering virtual services seeks to be um, an improvement in the type of care that patients will add to receive. And then there's, you know, maybe some of the softer components, like, um, you know, you'll hear terms like consumer convenience or even um, patient privilege, whereby, you know, they comment on aspects like, oh, you know, if you want medical attention, you no longer need to take excessive amounts of time out of your day and travel large distances and sit in waiting rooms. No, you can open your laptop on your couch and get expert advice without having to move. And so, from the perspective of consumers, it seems like there is value on the table when it comes to virtual care. But what about for the healthcare world as a whole? Is there value in implementing virtual care solutions? And if so, what? Um, so, in light of our foresight theme this year, which is about a shift of focus, shifting focus from, you know, shifting focus to some of the things that have arrived more recently, but also shifting focus back to things that we were focused on before COVID drew all of our attention. And so one, uh, one focus point that surrounds healthcare systems around the world is this idea of being able to transition from a uh, primarily reactive healthcare model to something that is, you know, emphasizes being preventative more. And so what do virtual consults really have to do with that? Well, you know, there's a volume of research papers that look to link the use of virtual care with um, controlling the burden of chronic diseases. Now, in South Africa, we've seen a consistent and steady rise in chronic comorbidities, and we understand that this is one of the most significant uh, pressures that our healthcare system has to deal with. So, I mean, where, do, where, do, where does virtual care fit into controlling chronic diseases? Well, one of the key advantages, I would say, of having virtual care is really from a patient perspective, there's this ease of accessibility. It's a far more accessible aspect of healthcare, especially for patients who are in the process of, you know, regularly using healthcare, generally making an appointment online and not having to travel or do anything like that means that there's, it's, well, it's, it's easier. It's easier to, to visit practitioners and practices and stuff like that and to use services. And so, there's the notion that um, implementing virtual care services will allow for the better utilization of healthcare resources. And what that can mean, or what the hopes are, is that with more frequent visits and more regular visits and more exposure to your healthcare professionals, um, there's the potential for early detection of chronic conditions. And, you know, with the early detection of chronic conditions and the right information being passed around, there is the potential to prevent these conditions from becoming more serious and from ensuing more serious downstream costs, thus lessening the burden that our healthcare facilities and professionals have to deal with. All right, and then the ability to, again, on the lines of being able to, um, you know, access healthcare facilities more easily, there's the ability to monitor those with chronic conditions more easily. And there are a lot of um, care coordinated plans at the moment that have made use of virtual consultations and have looked at, with patients that have chronic conditions, have looked at regularly monitoring them and seeing the progression of their diseases with the hopes that there is the opportunity to slow that progression down and once again lessen the burden going forward. And then perhaps another advantage for the healthcare system as a whole is this idea of um, more efficient management of healthcare resources. And there are a few occasions where this has come up. Perhaps, you know, the one that comes to mind most easily is maybe the, uh, the MediClinic uh, Intercare regional network that makes use of mandatory virtual consultations, and they serve a, a triage and a screening process there. And what we saw from that occasion was, um, you know, larger regional networks that were able to survive with, you know, fewer healthcare facilities and practitioners simply because we separated the serious cases from the non-serious cases and our resources were better spread. So perhaps just a few aspects there that you know, lead to um, you know, value for the healthier system as a whole. But I mean, virtual consults aren't the only thing that make up modern telemedicine, are they? <laughs>
No, so wearables have actually been the biggest aid in allowing patients to be monitored closely from home whilst carrying on with their day-to-day -day activities. The hype surrounding all of these wearable devices has had a positive spin-off on the healthcare industry, with people suddenly becoming much more aware of their health status to a point where they're almost obsessed with meeting their daily exercise goals. I have friends that sit on the couch doing this, <laughs> trying to get their steps in um, every night if they, if they haven't managed to meet their 10,000 step goal. Anyway, the, the user-friendly setup of fitness apps allows people to visually see and track their health um, and monitor their vitals. Um, they can track their heart rate, their calorie intake, distance walked and sleep patterns, and this has created a whole generation of younger adults that take an active interest in looking after their health. This will hopefully reap the benefits in the long run. In the last four years, the use of wearables has quadrupled. Since 2018, there were 9% of users used um, wearable devices. Now in 2022, we sit at 33% um, of wearable devices. With 84 million people now making use of wearable device, devices and technology, some of this has been driven by companies providing wearable devices to their employees in order to try and enhance employee wellness throughout their company. Wearables have now become so advanced that they can measure electrocardiograms, atrial fibrillation, and soon they'll be able to measure blood glucose. And as if that's not enough, it can also measure whether you snore at night, whether you've had a good or a bad dream, and soon it'll be scheduling in bathroom breaks into your team's calendar. <laughs> Wouldn't Sheldon Cooper love that? All of this advancement in technology has allowed telehealth to become more integrated and sophisticated than ever. Data can be uploaded in real time, and automated systems can be used to process all of this data. The data can be used to create e-health records that can be accessed by medical practitioners across the country. We are now able to have early warning systems in place that detect before a major medical event happens in order to try and help patients get preventative care before irreversible damage is done. The integration of good quality cameras on most smart devices has allowed patients to be able to consult with their doctors um, from anywhere in the country in the privacy of their own homes. All in, the proce all, in all, this process has become much more user-friendly, much more efficient, much easier, scalable, and much more valuable in improving the health care of patients. But with all things, there comes with some concerns. The biggest issue for all modern-day individuals that they experience every single day of their lives is data security and data privacy. FaceTime and WhatsApp is generally not considered secure enough for doctor-patient interactions. A concession was made during the COVID pandemic to allow doctors to use this platform. However, if telemedicine is here to stay, a more sustainable and more secure solution will need to be developed in the long run. Yeah, and as Lisa mentioned, if we're looking at the feasibility of telemedicine in the long run, another aspect to maybe consider is the remuneration of practitioners through, um, through virtual consults and through um, you know, other aspects of broader telemedicine, right? So the key issue maybe perhaps is that Tele telemedicine consults aren't necessarily less work for practitioners. They oftentimes take more time and um, generally use the same amount of thinking as well. But there are disparities in the remuneration rates and the reimbursement models and stuff. And so aspects like whether schemes choose to, um, schemes choose to list virtual consults as part of their benefits and benefit packages on different options and the majority of the options and where the provider remuneration is commensurate for the amount of work they're putting in are going to be large factors that will um, determine whether we see telemedicine having a permanent or a long-term presence in the healthcare world. There has to be um, an incentive for practitioners to continue 
to practice telemedicine. And then perhaps, you know, some of the other uh, more general risk factors of virtual consults being when you're not in person with a patient anymore, there are naturally risks that are going to come along with that. Some of those may be, I can't examine you physically. Is there a greater risk for misdiagnosis? Is there a greater risk for um, prescription of medication that's not as appropriate? We're relying on the patient to communicate information. Um, and this is also built into some of the perceptions that patients have about virtual consultations relative to being in person with doctors. Technological barriers is another aspect to consider. It has many different components. Firstly, you have ESCOM's power issues and the lack of any decent internet signal when, es when load shedding decides to grace us with its presence. But even more of a barrier is the speed at which technology is developing in comparison to the ability of the users to keep up with the, with the development in technology. Generally, health entrepreneurs market and expect that it's the Gen Z population, the age group just below th those of the developers, um, that are going to be the ones using telehealth and um, fitness apps. So hence, they target smartphones and social media and technology to this population. But we need to ask ourselves, who are, which population actually spend the most on healthcare, and that's the elderly. The elderly are a constantly expanding population. In the US, they consist of 14% of the population, but consume up to 30% of the prescription and the OTC medication. So whilst Gen Zs are more comfortable with multiple apps and widgets and functionalities all squashed onto a small screen, the older population would prefer a more simplistic approach that has a slightly more human element incorporated into the design. These two groups utilize telemedicine, <clears throat> but they utilize it differently. And the developers need to bear this in mind when developing apps and products targeted to these two different audiences. People may say that seniors are completely lost when it comes to using smartphones, but it may be surprising to hear that actually 60% of senior um, people are actively looking at digital solutions to try and improve their health care. It would also be surprising to find out that it's, um, when you look at the virtual consults of specialists, the over 50 population actually has a higher utilization of virtual consults compared to the under 50 population. When you look at GPs, however, that's the graph on the left, um, you don't see this, the same kind of trend. This is likely because both groups experience symptoms that are acute enough to warrant an in-person visit. However, when it comes to specialist visits, older people generally already have a pre diagnosed condition, and this visit that they have with the specialist is more of a follow-up to monitor their symptoms, see if there's any side effects from the drugs that they're taking, monitor whether we need to increase the drugs or reduce it, and this can all be done via oral consultations, via a virtual medium. When younger people visit a specialist, they generally don't have a pre-diagnosis, and they generally have more acute symptoms, which means that they have to have an um, in-person consult. Additionally, the pensioner, pop pensioner population may struggle in terms of physical strength to be able to make it to a, a physical consultation, um, or they may not be able to drive themselves, whatever the reason may be. But this might explain why the virtual consults are less popular among the 20 to 50 year age group for specialists and more popular for the over 50s. Now something that I found quite fascinating is to see the levels of utilization of virtual consults across the country from before COVID until the first lockdown and then how this has changed post-lockdown. You can see that the utilization of virtual consults across the country from 2017 has been fairly low in terms of numbers. 
Now when you take a look at the utilization post the first lockdown, we can see how it explodes and we can see how the utilization in the rural areas has increased since the lockdown. It's positive to see how virtual consults are being used by people in these rural areas, as the aim of virtual consults is to break down those barriers that come with distance and lack of access to affordable transport and allow people to access top quality doctors in big cities, even though they live in um, more remote locations. We also took a look at the average distance between the member and the provider that they consulted virtually. It's interesting to see that in Limpopo, in Limpopo, patients consulted practitioners on average about 160 kilometers away. This is three times as far as patients um, that live in big cities like Gauteng. So this might suggest that patients that live in Limpopo are utilizing virtual healthcare in order to get access to better quality healthcare that they would be able to get access to locally. Whereas people in Gauteng, or the other big cities, are possibly using virtual healthcare purely for the convenience factor. It's also interesting to note that the utilization of virtual consults correlates almost directly with the incidence of the COVID waves that we've seen in South Africa since March 2020. Over the last few months, the utilization has stabilized somewhat to a level that was, is considerably higher than the pre-COVID levels, but only time will tell as to whether this is going to be a long-term a, a long thing or whether it's a flash in the pan. Yeah, and that's an excellent question, right, as to whether, whether this is going to have some kind of permanent presence in the healthcare world. And the reality is our data hasn't showed us yet whether that's going to be the case. I mean, even, even in the peak of COVID waves, right, where we saw 20 to 30 times the uptake of virtual consults, these were still 3% or 4% of what the you know, physical consult levels were on normal days. So at the moment, we haven't seen um, evidence yet to say that, look, virtual consultations and virtual care solutions are going to necessarily have this presence in the future. But so part of the other reason that we wanted to uh, chat about this topic was, um, you know, maybe in another way, there is an appeal in the sense that the, uh, the long-term value of, of virtual consultations and care in general may be rooted in its perceptions with the generations that are still to come, right? Um, and then the question naturally arises or so that how do our youth really think about healthcare? Um, and this, this argument about having disparate views between, um, you know, generations and their perspectives on healthcare really you know, often stems from the fact that we are talking about generations that just have been brought up in such a different context. You know, these, um, these digital natives, as people like to call them, the, uh, the Gen Zs and Alphas, as they are formerly known, the earliest of whom are born at the turn of the century, have, you know, spent their entire lives exposed to digital platforms. Um, they, uh, they almost speak a digital language and navigate and process online walls as if, you know, it was nothing to them. Their access to, uh, most of their needs are met through uh, mobile applications. You know, if they're looking for retail goods, they're on take a lot. If they're hungry, they look on what's on Mr. D. Their groceries are done on Checkers 60. Their clothes come from Superbalist, you know. You find many of them sitting on auctions using Orco all around the country or so. It's a different generation to deal with or so. And, their conceptions about virtual care and virtual care solutions may be a determinant in um, their presence going forward. And so we were fortunate in the prep of this uh, presentation also not just to rely on hard research, but also to have the opportunity to maybe uh, speak to friends and friends of friends that satisfied our generational quota and get the chance to ask them, you know, some general perspectives about healthcare, but also what they thought about consults specifically or so. And, um, again, something enabled by technology, but you know, many of them had perhaps what would seem like bizarre questions about healthcare. Like a lot of them thought healthcare was important, but 
many were confused at the idea that there wasn't really you know, an app where I could compare different health cares or the fact that many schemes, applications for healthcare, you had to already be a member. And I remember someone saying to me, like, well, how do I know if I want it, if I have to be a member already to see the app that tells me what it has, you know? Um, but what was interesting about the conversations that we did have from them were when we brought up things like virtual consultations, a lot of them quickly realized, and this is perhaps a disparity in, um, you know, the perceptions from one generation to another, a lot of them quickly realized that this wasn't meant to be a replacement for in-person consults. Um, and like I said, this is maybe one of the hold-ups when it comes to the current generation and how they look at virtual care is it's almost automatically compared in their minds, well, oh, if I'm in a virtual consult, well, there are all these things that won't be the same as if I'm in person. And these kids sort of looked at it and said, well, this is kind of, it's like an add-on. It's its own offering and it might have its own utility with it. And, some of them remarked and said, you know, like we spend a lot of time on WebMD anyway, so this is really quite a step up from that. So um, it was nice to get a perspective from the youth and realize that, you know, maybe their environment and their upbringing makes them look at things differently. Um, and not just virtual care, but a lot of aspects in healthcare. And this, this generation of people, right, if we use 2000 as our marker point, then the earliest of them are now perhaps leaving tertiary education and looking to enter the world and start engaging with healthcare. Um, and if their perceptions are dramatically different, say towards things like virtual care, then our data now may not be indicative of what's going to have a long-term value. We maybe need to start looking at what is the next generation looking at and how do they behave and how do we make sure that our healthcare products and services are suited to um, you know, their perceptions and their interests. Thank you.